happy to present to you uh, Dr. Russell Howell. He's all the way here from Westmont College out in California. He's over there. Uh, so he's our keynote speaker for Focus Series this year, 2018. I'm very excited to have him. I'm very excited that Focus is actually on a mathematical topic. That's exciting. Yay for that. Uh, and so he's here to give us talk a little bit about the history of calculus, uh, the chaos surrounding the formation of calculus. So very appropriate for this class, calculus. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. So please make Dr. Howell feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you. They, I don't think they clap for me. No. At Westmont, they never clap. But they don't do. They don't do. Only <laughs> for. Yeah, right. All right, there really was chaos in the sense of turbulence and disruption surrounding the formation of calculus. You know, so I don't want this to be a lecture where I do the talking. I, don't, I want you to ask questions and feedback. I'm going to start by asking you a question. Who are the two founders of calculus? Yes. Was Isaac Newton? Yep, that's one. Okay. He was British. And then a German. There was a controversy there that uh, maybe Dr. Wagner will talk to you about some other time who took credit for who founded calculus and a bitter dispute. But the two folks are Gottfried Leibniz, who, who published first and Isaac Newton, who discovered earlier, although he delayed publishing. I want to talk a little bit, just quickly, about the background of Newton. He was born there, Wolf, Wolfsdorf by Colesworth. Wow. Here's London. Here's Oxford. That's about an hour and <coughs> 20 minutes by car. And then you, you can't really get there very easily. I was there, oh, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago. <coughs> This is where he was born, sort of an upper middle class background. This was his house. You'll learn about this symbol later, and, but it's just <laughs> coincidence. It's called an interval sign. And it's just a design there. Um, you can't really see this by the entryway. It says when he was born, uh, December 25th. This is his birthday. Can you want to read that? Just barely, right here. All right, this is uh, the sitting room, just to give you a sense of the style of his house. The kitchen, when you love to have a kitchen like that, you can imagine <laughs> roasting something here over an open fire. And this is his actual birthplace. He was born, Isaac Newton was born in this room. And there's an epitaph here. Uh, I just cropped it so you can't read it very well, but it's by Alexander Pope. And he says, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Can someone sort of paraphrase that? What's the meaning of that? Nature and nature's, what did Newton discover that he's sort of well known for? Besides calculus. Gravity. Gravity, yeah. So that's what that is about. By the way, you probably heard the legend of you know, Newton thinks about it. That's actually true, he says in his diary. The falling of an apple gave me a occasion to think about this. And that's the apple tree on his property. Of course, that wasn't the apple tree during Newton's time, but it was the same kind of tree. Now, just a little bit of that. This is what this guy did. He did experiments with color in the eye. I'm going to have you read this. So this is his own right handwriting here. And... Uh, where does it begin? At any rate, this is this would be easier. So you want to read that out loud? I'm sorry for embarrassing you. I took a bodkin, G H. That's this, the bodkin. A bodkin is like a knitting needle. Okay. Oh, and put it betwixt my eye and the bone as near to the back side of my eye as I could. Okay, so here he is. He has colors, All right? <laughs> And pressing my eye with the end of it so as to make the curvature A, B, C, D, E, F in my eye, there appeared several white, dark, and colored circles. Sticks this knitting needle in his eye and then presses it. See these? Which circles were plainest when I continued to rub my eye with the point of the bodkin. 
But if I held my eye and the bodkin still, though I continued to press my eye with it, yet the circles would grow faint and often disappear until I removed them by moving my eye or the bodkin. If the experiment were done in a light room so that though my eyes were shut, some light would get through their lids, there appeared a great broad bluish dark circle outmost. And within that, another light spot whose color was much like that in the rest of the eye as at K, within which spot appeared still another blue spot, R. Especially if I pressed my eye hard and with a small pointed bike and, and outmost at VT appeared a verge of light. Oh, I love that. Especially if I pressed my eye hard. <laughs> Do not try this at home. Do not give this as an assignment. Or in the dorm. <laughs> yeah. wow. So this is um, the chaos of Newton's personality, but I'm going to talk about the chaos of his work, the, the controversy that was generated. Now, um, Isaac Newton, you might know, was installed as the second Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge University. There's a very famous person who recently died a physicist who was also the Lucasian chair of mathematics. Anyone know who that was? He wrote a book called The Brief History of Time. Oh, yeah. First name is Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. He's in that tradition. So this is a very prestigious slot. And looking back, it must have been really phenomenal to hear someone so great. But sadly, Two things. Cambridge was changing from a lecture to a tutorial system at the time. Do you know what a tutorial system is? That's what they have today. You don't give lectures. People study on their own. They, they meet with their tutors to ask questions. And in any case, Newton was not a very popular lecturer. Um, this was also true of Arnold Toynbee in Oxford. The word was, take Lewis, but don't take Toynbee. Now, how would you feel if you were living today and took that advice and avoided taking a class from Toynbee? Just saying that because students at Westmount at least have all these, <laughs> don't take so-and-so, he's hard, take so-and-so. Don't listen to them. Students don't really have a good sense of you know, what scholarship is yet here to learning. So this is what a biographer of Newton says. So if you want to hear him, and fewer yet understood him, that oft times he did in a manner for want of hearers, read to Ewald's. <laughs> now that's actually true. The biographer goes on and said, Newton's lectures would generally last about a half hour, no matter how few people attended. Unless, of course, no one attended. In that case, Newton would only lecture for 15 minutes. <laughs> so today, I'm delighted that I am not lecturing to the walls, but that also means that I'll be talking a little longer than 15 minutes. And if I see some of you nodding off, that'll be my signal to stop. Now there's a, this title, um, The Chaos Surrounding uh, the Formation of Calculus. Well, when I talk about it, I hope you'll think about two questions <clears throat> that I'll sort of unpack. The first is faith required for mathematics and the second is, is mathematics required for faith? Now I suspect, what would, you, what would your answer be to that question? Is faith required for mathematics? Mm -hmm. You don't have to answer personally. What do you think the average Joe on the street would say? Is no. faith required no. for mathematics? No. no, it's all reasoning and so on, right? Is mathematics required for faith? What do you think the average person would say? No. So it might come to no surprise that my answer to those two questions <laughs> is a resounding yes. So let's see why, and let's see how that relates to the chaos surrounding the formation of calculus. I want to talk about a, a contemporary, or actually not a contemporary, but a person that came after Isaac Newton named George Barclay, who was Bishop of Cloyne in Cloyne, Ireland. Uh, he wrote an essay called this, The Analyst, or a Discourse 
addressed to an infidel <laughs> mathematician. Now, a lot of people think that this infidel not mathematician is Isaac Newton. It certainly is not. In the essay, Barclay, that's how you pronounce his name in British, it depends, of course, where you're raised in Britain, but that's how he would pronounce his name. Um, Barclay, in his essay that I'll talk to you about, um, derides people who praise Newton for his mathematics, but make fun of him for his religion. So Newton was a firm believer in the scriptures. He was not a Christian in the sense that we would think of him because he didn't believe in the deity of Christ, but he certainly believed in God and took the scriptures at their word. So um, this, what, what prompted this essay? So you gotta imagine that Barclay is a clergyman. He's also, uh, his first paper was in mathematics, but he was a clergyman. And a, a, phys a London physician named Samuel Garth who was gravely ill, living in London. So he sends a parishioner named Joseph Addison to go down and visit Garth, trying to get Garth to confess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And this is the reply by Garth. Surely, Addison, I have no, I have good reason not to believe those trifles. In other words, this stuff you're talking to me about. Since my friend, Dr. Haley, who has de uh, dealt so much in demonstration, has assured me that the doctrines of Christianity are incomprehensible and the religion itself is an imposture. All right, so that's why some people think Barclay wrote this essay. I think that was a contributing factor, but not the proximal cause, because Garth and Addison both died in 1719. Barclay wrote this essay 15 years later, in 1734. I think what the proximal cause was that a caustic remark came back to uh, Barclay over another book that Barclay had written just two years prior in 1732. Um, and you can see what he's saying here at the beginning of the essay, how he's deriding this person, this Edmund Halley. Though I am not a stranger, though I am a stranger to your person, yet I am not, sir, a stranger to the reputation you have acquired in that branch of learning with, which hath been your peculiar study, nor to the authority that you therefore assume in things foreign to your profession nor to the abuse that you and too many more of like character are known to make of such undue authority, to the misleading of er unwary persons in matters of the highest concernment, and whereof your mathematical knowledge can by no means qualify you to be a competent judge." So that was, that's right at the beginning of his uh, essay, The Analyst, or Discourse Addressed to an Infidel Mathematician. The book that I mentioned that Barclay wrote in 1932 is identified here in the title page. This is the full title page. I just showed you this part earlier. It's by the author of the Minute Philosopher. Doesn't, it's not Minute Philosopher, Minute Philosopher. <laughs> Actually, the full, the full title of the book is, the way you pronounce this, Al Kifron, or the Minute Philosopher. Barclay's 1732 book has a title that criticizes Al Kifran for being a second rate, very minute philosopher. Uh, Al Kifran is for, was an ancient Greek sophist who specializes in specious reasoning, you know, arguments that were sort of away from the mainstream. And the dialogue, can, uh, there's seven or nine dialogues, I guess, in this book between Al Kifran and his associate, and Euphrenor, who was a free thinker, and his associate. Now, I don't know if you've taken any uh, history classes, but the free thinking movement was sweeping wide in the United Kingdom, and it consisted of people who wanted to have a, empirical solid evidence before they would believe anything. So they poo-pooed people who relied on tradition, What's that thing in the quad there? <laughs> mm -hmm. Revelation. Mm -hmm. Reason was fine, and experience was fine, but two of Wesley's quads were, were phenomenal. And they pointed to the disputes that was arising in religion. So on, on the one hand, you have mathematics. They said, 
firm and solid reasoning versus religion, tradition, and superstition. Mathematics, logical demonstration, religion, superstition, and beliefs based that are just on authority, that kind of thing. Now, um, most of these free thinkers were either atheists or deists. You know what a deist is? Mm -hmm. Tell me, what is a deist? Not sure, anyone? Oh. No, uh, a deist is when um, they believe that yeah, they believe that there is a God, but that it's not, like, Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's not involved. Like, they don't, he doesn't have to work. There's some cosmic force, we'll call him God, that started the universe and then doesn't, doesn't care at all. That's, that's a deal. All right, so most of the free thinkers were that. Now, Barclay applauded the use of reason and careful thinking, to be sure. But he also insisted that mystery was an important component of the Christian faith. <clears throat> in the sixth dialogue of that book, uh, al Kifron and Euphronor are going back and forth. And Euphronor argued that the mysterious or the obscure should not be equated with logical incoherence. You can have mystery and still be reasonable. Revelation, he claimed, was almost by definition at least partly remote from human experience. So by its very nature, it would seem foreign to it. Now I want to show you a couple of uh, titles of a couple of tracks against the free thinkers <clears throat> that were floating around in Barclay's time. So here's one. Christianity not mysterious. No, this is a tract against the free thinkers. So they're saying, no, 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 you're wrong. Christianity isn't mysterious. Barclay's got to say, yes, it is. A treatise showing that there is nothing in the gospel contrary to reason or above it. And that no Christian doctrine can be properly called a mystery. <clears throat> really? Not even the Trinity? Okay. <laughs> Here's another one. A discourse, this is the title, A Discourse Concerning Reason with Regard to Religion and Divine Revelation wherein it is shown that reason either is or else that it ought to be a sufficient guide in matters of religion. So these are very typical uh, 18th century titles. This is Barclay's full 18th century title. When you read through it, the title tells you pretty much about the whole thing. <coughs> so the second part wherein it is examined whether the object, principles, and inferences of the modern analysis, that means of the calculus, are more distinctly conceived or more evidently deduced than religious mysteries or, or points of faith. Did you get that? I kind of stumbled a little bit. One more time. It is, so the analyst or a discourse addressed to an infidel mathematician. Wherein it is examined whether the object, principles, and inferences of the modern analysis, that means calculus, are any more evidently deduced than religious mysteries or points of faith. Or not just that, any more distinctly conceived or evidently deduced than that. So, uh, what Barclay's going to do is say to the free thinkers that you break your own rules. Mm -hmm. He's going to say that you, the, the people who rely on calculus, rely on authority and tradition. And you also have to live with mysteries and logical, not contradictions, but logical gaps in your thinking. And you might say, well, how could that be? Well, let's take a look. First, though, <clears throat> he hammers that home with this. I don't know if you can see it. It's a quote from Matthew chapter 7, verse 5. First, cast out the beam in thine own eye, and then you shall be able to see clearly to remove the moat from your brother's eye. All right, so that's the background. Now, you all know how calculus works. You, at least you know how derivatives work. <clears throat> Do you know, <clears throat> excuse me, why Newton created calculus, what his motivation was? It has to do with his laws of gra gravitation. He wanted to be able to predict the paths of comets. All right, so if you have a comet that's being pulled in a circle, it's because there's some planet or some, some gravitational pull on it, rather than going off in a straight line. 
he wanted to be able to predict where that comet would be if there were no object there after that. So he had to get this red tangent line. And you all know the process, correct? What did he do? Well, he picked a point. I'm just calling this point one. And this is Newton's notation. You probably call this <coughs> one plus h, or something like that, or x plus delta x. Newton calls it one plus o. And then this point up here, he would compute, because he knew where <coughs> the observations put it. And he would compute the rise over the run, and get the slope of that, what's that line called? Not the tangent line, but the tangent line. And then what happens? A little closer. And then a little closer. And then a little closer. And then, well, do you ever make O0? Well, let's see how the calculations work. <coughs> Excuse me, if you took the curve y equals x squared, which you probably have worked with, I'm not going to go through it, but this, these are the algebraic steps. And notice you've got expression 1 here and expression number 3. How do you get from 1 to 3? Well, Newton used this language. I'm going to expunge the O. Why? Well, it's just so small, I'm not going to worry about it. Barclay said, wait a minute, <clears throat> essentially in his essay, you can't just expunge the O, because if you can get rid of it here, you're treating that it, it, that it's zero. But then that makes this expression nonsensical. You have zero divided by zero. That's essentially Barclay's argument, right? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Did no Newton really do that? Well, here's a... Here's his book, Methods of Fluxions and Infinite Series. And this is not Newton's handwriting. It was a you know, transcript, an edition that's been set in print. But here's sort of an interesting part that I underlined. But whereas O is supposed to be infinitely little, that it may represent the moments of quantities, the terms that are multiplied by it, that is the terms that are multiplied by O, will be nothing with respect to the rest. Therefore, I reject them. That's Newton's own words. Or how about this one? This being done, all the terms of the third order will still be affected by O of one or more dimensions, and may therefore be expunged as infinitely less than the others. All right, so how does that stack up with Barclay? Uh, Newton's this, with this language, he tempted to get around the problem of dividing by zero, didn't he? Uh, the increment O is getting smaller and smaller, and it's somehow becoming something infinitely small, but not zero. And you know what he called it? He called it, here's an interesting phrase, an evanescent increment. <laughs> evanescent, you know what the word evanescent means? <clears throat> something that's just sort of emerging, an evanescent increment. Uh, velocity or speed or these tangent lines, which we just saw the calculation, is called this, an ultimate ratio of evanescent increments. <laughs> that was his language, an ultimate ratio of evanescent increments. Now, Barclay did not dispute that the conclusions of calculus were correct. He rather thought that the correct results were obtained by a serendipitous cancellation of errors. It would almost be something like this. You all know that 16 over 64 <laughs> equals 1 4, right? Mm -hmm. But what if I told you I got it by canceling the sixes? <laughs> yeah, there we go. We get 1 4. All right, that's sort of, sort of bar. You just lucked out. I, I think your calculations are right, but your logic is all messed up. Now, the logic of free thinkers who accepted calculus, <coughs> said Barclay, was careless and certainly less rigorous than the thinking of those engaged in divinity. And two quotations from the analyst will help drive home this point. The second is probably the most famous in all the essay, and I, I bet that your professors have heard this because it's well known in the mathematical community. So, here's what Barclay says. 
He's criticizing Newton's calculus again. I now beg to make a new supposition, contrary to the first supposition, that there is no increment in x, or that O is nothing. So I'm going to go contrary to that. And get expression obtained in virtue of my first supposition, and which could not be obtained without it. In other words, if I don't expunge the O, I don't get an answer. All of which seems mo a most inconsistent way of arguing, and such as would not be allowed <laughs> in divinity. You're not going to find that sloppy thinking, he says in divinity. And here's the famous quote. Remember, Newton called these things fluxions, these ultimate ratios of ulti uh, effort, evanescent increments. So Barclay says, and what are these fl fluxions? The velocity of evanescent increments? And what are these same evanescent increments? They are neither finite quantities, nor quantities infinitely small, nor yet nothing. Listen to this. May we not call them the ghosts <laughs> of departed quantities. That's his phrase. Now, I don't know if you've had any, any you take, you, in your common core, you take philosophy at some point, yeah? Have you had that yet? Maybe. Well, George Barclay, I don't know if you talked about him, he's a famous philosopher. He's what's called an empirical idealist. He did not believe in the existence of an external world. And the reason for that is it was very important for Barclay to be able to conceive of an idea before he believed it. So right before John Barclay, or contemporaneous <coughs> with him, was the philosopher John Locke, who made a state, he believed in the external world, and he made a distinction between what's called primary qualities of an object and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are like extension and number. Secondary qualities are things like color or taste. And Barclay says, I can't conceive of something with primary, primary qualities without accompanying secondary qualities. Mm -hmm. So those two things, there's no distinction between them. And so he rejected the primary qualities that Locke was thinking. There's just these secondary qualities, the things that are in the mind. Everything is thought of in God's mind, according to Barclay. Now, some people think that um, he objected to these fluxions because they were sort of real things. I think it was because he just couldn't conceive of them, because that was big in his, his philosophy. <clears throat> so a little treat. Barclay spent his last years at Harris Manchester College in Oxford. So I was privileged to have an appointment at Oxford for a year. And a friend of mine went to Harris Manchester College. And this is uh, where Barclay lived the last few years of his life. And there's an inscription there. I've got a um, it, re it reveals classic British humor. Ber uh, George, uh, Bishop George Bar Barclay, philosopher, is perceived <laughs> to have lived and died here. The reason that's humorous is because Bar Barclay's mantra is essay est percipi, to be perceived is to be, is to be. Being is perceiving. So Barclay was perceived to have lived and died here. And I, I said, look, that's not quite right. We need to change that to not philosopher, but mathematician. Now, they didn't change it. But I mentioned earlier, Barclay's first paper was really in mathematics. <clears throat> so contrary to those who think that Barclay's complaints, uh, complaint, complaints against Newton stem mainly from his idealism, I think that it was rather, as I said earlier, that he couldn't conceive of these evanescent increments. They just didn't make any sense. And the logic, Barclay said, didn't make sense. But whatever the motives for his criticizing were, Barclay's essay gave impetus to a flurry of chaos, a flurry of activity, in an effort to shore up logical gaps he exposed. And you could go back to British literature. There's a whole series of responses to Barclay's essay. No, 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 we can get around it this way, we can do that. Do you know when calculus was finally shored up? So Newton does his work in the 1600s. Yes. Barclay was writing this in the 1700s. It really wasn't until Augustin Cauchy came up with the notion of limit in the 1800s that the sort of the foundations. So before that, there's chaos. We don't really know what we're doing. So here are some of the assessments of Barclay's work. Bishop Barclay's ingenious criticisms in the Analyst remain to this day unanswered. Note the date, 1833. They were still not answered. The fact is, Newton himself 
had no knowledge of the true nature of his method of prime and ultimate ratios. And then someone who's uh, still living today teaches it in, in, in Florida. Newton's procedure here is entirely mysterious. He's written a couple of books on uh, Barclay and the works that he's written. So why was it so important for mathematicians to fill in these logical gaps? Anyone tell me why? Once they're exposed, why is it important? <laughs> it's a simple answer. That's what mathematicians do. That's what mathematicians do. You, you, you don't want to have inconsistent. You want things to be rigorous. And uh, you know who first set the paradigm in motion for the practice of mathematics? It's a Greek mathematician. It goes back to 300 BC. Anyone know the name? Someone you might have learned about when you had high school geometry. What's that? Uh, he's actually before this person, but yeah, that was a good guess. So the person that wrote this book called The Elements begins with an E. <laughs> okay, we'll have your teachers. Uh, Euclid. Euclid. So what was his paradigm? You start with certain undisputed truths called postulates or axioms. By the way, the word axiom comes from the Greek word axios, which means worthy. So an axiom is something that is worthy of belief. In Revelation, you see the, the uh, scriptural verse, worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Worthy, that's the idea of uh, an axiom. So once, what's the paradigm? So you have these axioms that everyone accepts, and then you do what? Well, you use logical reasoning to deduce truths. And with those, Euclid had five axioms and five common notions and some definitions. And in his first book, there's 43 propositions, about 40, 48 propositions that he proves. 13 books altogether that constitute the body of the elements. So that's the paradigm for mathematics. We're going to have these axioms and we're going to prove things. All right. So, uh, how does that relate to faith? Well, just think about that. You got these axioms. What if you find logical gaps? Gaps, what do you do? Do you give up everything? No, what do mathematicians? What, what, what did they do back in Barclay's day? All right, Barclay exposed these logical gaps. We're going to do what? Resolve them. We're going to work them out. It took two centuries, but they eventually worked it out. But you go back to that time, they didn't give it up. They, they practiced out of faith. Well, it wasn't blind faith, it was reasoned faith. We see that these things work, it makes sense. Um, <clears throat> all right, so whether they would recognize it or not, the practices, the people practicing mathematics, mathematics in Newton's time needed faith. But do we need faith today for mathematics? I'm going to say yes. And to see why, let's talk about some episodes farther on in the history of mathematics. So there's a drive to put all of mathematics under a firm foundation with axioms that we can accept. OK, we believe these. Now what can we prove? So this person, Gottlob Frege, published a book called The Grundgesetze der Arithmetik, The Foundations of Arithmetic. And in that book, he has just five axioms that Here's the basis for all of arithmetic. We're going to prove all of arithmetic just with five axes. But does anyone know the story of what happened just before his book was published? He got a very disturbing letter from someone named Bertrand Russell. Have you heard of that person? And Bertrand Russell, did anyone know what he did? Sorry? Uh, didn't he take his work as his own? Did he what? Didn't he publish his work as his own? No, no, he actually was trying to help him. And he said, I got bad news for you, got low. Your fifth axiom contradicts your other four. Got low didn't realize it. <clears throat> so, oh my goodness, what's he got to do? His book's in press. So he quickly <laughs> patches it up and inserts a little appendix, you know, because the, the book's all right. So there's this little pamphlet in the book. And here's what it says. <clears throat> Hardly anything 
more unfortunate can befall a scientific writer than to have one of the foundations of his edifice shaken after the work is finished. This was in the position I was placed in by a letter of Mr. Mr. Bertrand Russell, just when the printing of this line was nearing its completion. All right, so that's what he does. But it was subsequently shown that Hagen's fix didn't work either. It was still contradictory. So now we've got this problem. He's publishing this work. Do you know when the axioms of mathematics were finally settled? What year? Anyone want to guess? 1922. Wow. Now, does that relatively late date surprise you? And does anyone know what those axioms are? They're called the Zermelo-Frankel axioms, ZF. And if you throw in axiom 10, which is called the axiom of uh, completeness, of choice rather, it's called ZFC. So I want to talk about this for a second. David Hilbert, one of the great mathematicians uh, who lived uh, in, the, in the 18th and 19th century, or 19th and 20th centuries, set out a, a proposal that, okay, look, uh, we've got these axioms here from 1922. Now, how do we know, how do we know that we're not going to find inconsistencies in them? Just like, Gottlob, just like Bertrand Russell found with Gottlob Frege's five axioms. Now we've got these 10 axioms. But how do we know they're consistent? Maybe there's some contradiction that we can't see, just like Gottlob Frege. So he proposed this rule, and here's what he says. The fundamental idea of my proof theory is not another than to describe the activity of our understanding, to make a protocol of the rules according to which our thinking actually proceeds. Already at this time, I would like to assert what the final outcome will be. Mathematics is a presuppositionalist science. To found it, I do not need God or the assumption of a special faculty of our understanding. So that's his, that's his goal. We're, we're going to we're gonna work towards this. This is the goal of mathematics. We want to prove these axioms are consistent. So we want to be able to, okay. So just one year later, Hilbert gave that talk in 1930. In 1931, a uh, Moravian-born mathematician, Kurt Gödel, dealt a severe blow to Hilbert's program. Uh, how many have heard of Kurt Gödel? OK, so here he is when, when he got married. So I, I put a picture with him. Everyone does know this person on the right. Yeah. Who's that? This person Einstein. That's Albert Einstein, right? That was taken when he was at the Advanced Institute of Princeton. This is the picture you usually see of Gerdel. But I've got a treat for you as students. Gerdel did his work at the University of Vienna, and I led Westmont's Europe program quite a few years ago, and stopped, we made a stop at Vienna, went to the library, and found a picture of Kurt Gerdel when he was a freshman at the university. <laughs> Would you like to see it? Yes. I don't think it's ever been shown before, but here he is. <laughs> uh, that's a joke. <laughs> I was in Vienna, but I didn't. So here he is a sophomore year. <laughs> didn't see any change between sophomore year and junior year. <laughs> But by senior year, well, he's yeah, right. cleaned himself up. Okay. So enough silliness. Let's take a look at what Gödel did in 1931. It was really something very phenomenal. He published a paper demonstrating what we now call his incompleteness theorems. The first one proved this. Remember, ZFC is the sort of acronym for the axioms that we're talking about, these 10 axioms. Depending on how you formulate it, there's about 10 axioms. He proved this. If ZFC is consistent, in other words, there's no logical gaps in it, then it contains true propositions that we can't prove to be true. And it also contains false propositions that we can't prove to be false. And that's one thing he proved. He said, okay, 
that's not so bad, but here's, here's the next thing that's really bad. Oh, by the way, this is, um, this is the, uh, the yes. famous symbolic logic version of this bit here. If ZFC is consistent, it can't be proven to be consistent. So, Hilbert, give up your idea of proving these axioms to be consistent. Because if they are, then you can't prove it to be consistent. That's essentially what Hurdle says. Uh, symbolically, this means if there exists some sort of sequence of arguments, why, <coughs> some proposition, why, for which there is no x that can be that you can demonstrate why. That's loosely translating if the system is consistent. An inconsistent system, everything can be proved. So if there's something that can't be proved, then this proposition here, this is the specific thing, can't be proved. That's essentially why this. You don't have to worry about that. That's essentially this method. Think about that. If arithmetic is consistent. We won't be able to prove it's consistent. So um, I got this email one day from a fellow mathematician. And here's what he said. Hey, I heard somewhere that you wrote a book about math and your faith. Having never, never understood how a rational person could possibly subscribe to the Christian dogma, except for having strong, some strong overriding subconscious need, perhaps, I'm curious about it. Although if it all comes down to, quote, faith, well, I've never had any idea of what that really means and don't think I have any uh -huh. in me, except perhaps in my ability to reason. By the way, I'm a happy member of the Skeptic Society out of Altadena, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. So I, of course, emailed him back and I said, hey, let's get together and have a chat. And what do you think? What do you think we talked about? It took about a year or so maybe two to get together. Well, I said, you say you don't have any faith. I want to show you that you do. Because you proceed as a mathematician with this set of axioms that you have no idea mm -hmm. if they're even consistent. But you go happily on. I'm not saying that you're wrong to do that. I do that. I'm a mathematician. So let's take a look at those 10 axioms. I would bet if you go to every uni any university in the country, pick out a random mathematician, ask, <laughs> can you name these 10 axioms? No way. No way. No way. Um, they just know that they are there. Mm -hmm. But they do their reasoning based on, you know, this just sort of makes sense to me. This, so this extension, the, the, the axioms are these symbols here. Two sets are equal if and only if they have the same members. For each x and y, x equals y, if and only if, for x, for all t. t is an x, if and only if t is in y. That's how that would read. This is the axiom of choice. There's actually um, the replacement scheme, which is an infinite collection of axioms embedded into one. Mm -hmm. So it's, there they are, <laughs> the axioms. So um, you think that the news of Girdle and so on would have thrown mathematicians into some sort of a tizzy, but this is what I point out to my friend. We, we just go happily on. Uh, why? On what basis do we, we, do we do our work, knowing that maybe it's not consistent? Let's do a thought experiment again. Ask a random math, math, mathematician. Why do you work within the context of the UFC? Well, something like this. Well, of course, I, I know that I can't prove ZFC is consistent. But I believe it is. <laughs> Why? Because I've got plenty of evidence. No contradiction has arisen mm -hmm. from 1922 to, to today, close to 100 years. The system produces results that are very satisfying. And the applications of mathematical theories actually work in the real world. Thus, for me, these outcomes provide an assurance of the consistency I hope for. They also provide a conviction of something I do not, nor cannot see, a proof of consistency. Let's think about that. The evidence of something hoped for, mm -hmm. the proof of something not seen. What does Hebrews chapter 11 say? 
That's what faith is. The evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. So, um, yes indeed, even today, whether they know it or not, all mathematicians have faith commitments that they rely on. All right, so, okay, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Your class ends at four. Four? Okay, well, I'm going to not go till four. But remember, there are two poor parts. Is faith necessary for mathematics? My argument is? Yes. But what about the second one? Is mathematics required for faith? Well, my answer to that is yes, but I'm not trying to be political here. This is just a joke. Is mathematics required for faith? It depends on what the meaning of the word required is. <laughs> So, if required is used in the sense of helpful for enriching your faith, then I would say yes. It can, it can enhance your faith, required in that sense. And I don't mean required in the sense of absolutely necessary. So, let's take a look at that. Uh, to do so, I want, to cho uh, I want to choose a couple of instances from the Gospels that sort of elucidate what I'm getting about. Do you, do you know the story of the Syrophoenician woman? That's the name of it. It's the one where um, her daughter is demon-possessed. She asks Jesus for help. And Jesus, in an unusual response, says to her, it's not good to take the children's oh, yes. bread and feed it to the dogs. Now, what does the Syrophoenician woman reply? Even the dogs eat from the crumbs of the master's table. And what does Jesus say? Great. O woman, great is your faith. That's one instance. And compare that with another one. The other one is a story that's recorded in both Matthew and Luke. It's a story of a Roman soldier whose servant is desperately ill. In Matthew's version, the soldier comes to Jesus and says this, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. When I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Then Jesus says to those around him, truly I say to you, I have found no, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Then he heals the servant. Now I think there's something in common with both of those stories. Both people are making an analogy based on their own experience or profession. Mm -hmm. The woman is drawing an analogy based on behavior she had seen among the dogs. She says, you know, even the dogs eat from the crumbs, I believe you'll give me some crumbs to Jesus. The soldier is using his profession and the authority that he has, and he knows what authority is, and he applies that to a belief in Jesus' authority to be able to heal his son. I'm under authority, hey, you're God, you have to heal. I believe you can heal my son. So, um, in other words, do you talk about the integration of faith and learning here? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Jesus gives those two people an A plus <laughs> on, on the grade of faith learning. They're able to really incorporate their faith into their learning, what they had learned from experience. Now, Arthur Holmes has written a book. He oh, yes. um, has died, well, he died about five years ago, but he wrote a very foundational book called The Idea of a Christian College. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he delineated four approaches to faith learning the attitudinal, the ethical, the foundational, and worldview. But I think there's another one he could have added based on these two gospel accounts. And I'm going to call it the pranological approach. Pranological because it, it's a practical application of an analogy. I mean, there's a better word, but you get it pran, practical, uh, logical. And so you have a practical application of an analogy that you draw to your faith from your own experience or <coughs> discipline. And how many of you here are mathematics majors? Are there any? How many, what are the rest of you, bio or free health or something? Or computer science. Computer science, okay. Well, I, I want to challenge you to try and work hard to find analogies 
this is tough because you could, you could really come up with dumb ones. But <laughs> analogies that are, are really meaningful from your discipline that you can apply to your faith. And I want to suggest uh, some of you in a sec. But to close, uh, just look, let's look at Barclay sort of. He has these pithy queries right at the end of his book, or his essay, let's call it. It's not that long of an essay. In fact, you can Google Bar Barclay's analyst and find it on the web. So he's asking these questions. Whether it not be less objectionable, objectionable to admit points above reason than contrary to reason. So something that you can't figure out doesn't mean that it's contrary to reason, according to Mark. It might just be above it. Whether mysteries may not, with better right, be allowed of in divine faith than in human science. Maybe there's a role for mystery. Whether mathematicians, as cry out against mysteries, have ever examined their own principles, right, in Barclay's time, what is this evanescent increment, that kind of stuff. Whether mathematicians, who are so delicate in religious points, are strictly scrupulous in their own science. Whether they do not submit to authority, take things upon trust, and believe points inconceivable. Whether they have not their mysteries, and what is more, their repugnancies and contradictions. So that's Barclay's So he said, look, you've got the same thing that you criticize us about. Now, regarding mysteries, little did Barclay know how percent prophetic his statements would be. So the logical gaps of the calculus have been erased, but I want to show you there's still some mysteries there. Let me mention a couple. You'll maybe get this later this semester. I'm not sure you could tell me whether this gets covered. So take the graph of y equals 1 over x. That's this thing, right? And rotate it around the x-axis. You get a megaphone, right? And now extend that out to infinity. You get something called Gabriel's horn. Why it's called Gabriel's horn? The angel Gabriel. Now, what you can show is the volume inside of this thing is finite, but the surface area is infinite. And as a student once remarked, wait a minute. <laughs> That means we can fill this thing with paint, but we can't paint the surface. Finite volume, infinite surface area. I don't think that's a severe logical problem, but it's an interesting puzzle. And if you want to have it, it's very easy to re resolve. Here's something that's not quite so uh, easy to resolve, it's called the bonnach Tarski paradox. This relies on the axiom of choice which essentially says if you have an infinite collection of non-empty sets, it's possible to pick one element out from each of those sets. That's all it says. Seems like, seems like that's right, one of the axioms. Using that paradox, you can take a sphere of radius one, decompose it into just five different parts, and without stretching them in any way, reassemble and get two <laughs> spheres of identical size. That's the bonnach karski paradox. Every mathematician agrees to that. You don't live with mystery, really. Well, how about this one? Maybe you've heard this. Maybe Dr. Wagner has talked to you about it. There's a sort of this very interesting thing between rational and irrational numbers. Between, you know what a rational number is? What is it? Yes. You can write it as a fraction, right? Very sure. And an irrational number, you can't write as a fraction. Like, give me an example of an irrational number. Pi. All right. So it's very easy to prove. Between any two rational numbers, there's an irrational number. Very easy to prove. Between any two irrational numbers, there's a rational number. If you go on in mathematics, or maybe if you go to lunch with Dr. Wagner someday, <laughs> it's easy to show there are more <laughs> irrational numbers than rational numbers. But there are infinitely many of both. Think about that. Every mathematician 
will say yes to those four things. They will say, every man will say yes. You don't tell me that that's a mystery. Mm -hmm. All right, so I want to close with just think about Gödel's theorem, think about Berkeley, the chaos of calculus. Just sort of a little pithy thing for you to take home. The uniqueness of mathematics in proof and faith. So if science, including mathematics, deals with what can be proved, and so I want you to think of Gödel's theorem, remember what he showed? If arithmetic is consistent, then what? You can't do what? You can't prove it. That's a theorem. He proved it. He proved you cannot prove that arithmetic <laughs> is consistent, if it is consistent. All right. So if science deals with what can be proved, and religion deals with what cannot be proved, then mathematics is the only science that can prove itself to be a religion. OK, thanks for your attention. That's it. Yeah, so. <laughs> you got any questions? Is it just the Midwest? My students are very talkative, or is it just you know, the flight to the or something? Can you go back a couple of slides? Same way. There. Oops. Mystery. Okay, cool. That's cool. If you go forward two slides to the rationals slide, I will just point out to everybody this is my advertisement for proof and discreet. <laughs> Math 232. Okay. Right. In and, the fall. And now it makes right. sense. We will get to this <laughs> in proof and discreet. So if you're in proof and discreet the semester, we'll get to it in proof and discreet. So there's something to this. Can you see this? <laughs> Yeah. You know, if you take Dr. Wagner's course, you see you. I guarantee you, it won't mean the same thing to you when you say God is infinitely wise or infinitely good. Yeah. That, it's going to be a much richer concept. And I think that's one thing mathematics can do. It can also help us. Look, all right, we believe that. That just seems like it can't be. So if you, if you can believe truths like this in a logically defined, carefully precise world like mathematics, it shouldn't upset you when you come about paradoxes in your faith. Mm -hmm. How can Jesus be fully God and fully God? How can God be three in one? You should be able to live with that a little more easily. So that's how mathematics is required for faith. It can help enrich your faith mm -hmm. by understanding and appreciating its beauty. Um, we also talk about this uh, exactly in Math 104 because that's math for the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. And this is a very liberal arts topic uh, for us to think about. And uh, it's one of the big ideas in math to bring out the idea of, it, of infinity. Yeah, in fact, it's not just, we hear we've got the rational numbers, and the irrationals are a larger set of infinity. <laughs> it never ends. There's infinitely many sets of larger infinities. That doesn't blow your mind, then nothing will. <clears throat> yes. Do you go to the last statement again? The last statement? At the, the last slide. The, this one is the last. Oh, this one here? Yeah. Can you explain that? Like, break that down? So, a lot of people like to say science deals with stuff that you can prove, like mathematics proves things. One of the things mathematics proves is that there's something we can't prove. Religion deals with what can't be proved. All right, then mathematics is the only science that can prove itself to be a religion because we have things we can't prove. That's what, it's just what you can't prove. It's not meant to be anything. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. Or just a fun way to say that. Well, you can thank me for not having your test on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs>